Welcome to our roundtable collaborative process in research in dried fish in Asia, social economy, nutrition and improvement. So this uh, roundtable is about the findings from the scoping research from dried fish matters, which is a project funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada to study dried fish in South and Southeast Asia. Uh, the session is organized into three themes. One is mapping dried fish social economies, dried fish as food, and examining improvement in dried fish social economies. Uh, there will be five to seven pre-recorded presentation per theme and a live uh, comment at the end of each session. And then if there's time allows, then we will have a brief discussion session at the end. So, um, so this is an, uh, there is also uh, an on-demand section uh, that is not going to be uh, aired, but then, then it's going to be uh, available for you and the chat box uh, and the chat. So the link will be in the chat. So please have a look. This will be the longer and in-depth presentation of some of the presentation that is not going to be aired now. You are also encouraged to put your questions and comments as well as the responses to comments and questions in the chat, which are uh, uh, while we, read, uh, we all watch the presentations together. So with this, I would like to start the, the session, the first session of ma uh, mapping dried fish social economies. Uh, this session uh, section is present, uh, uh, includes a presentation by Sujani Azpuma, Mazu, uh, Mahuza Laman, Tara Nair, Nikita Gopal, Ben Belton, and uh, Arjili Dasu, uh, with the, followed by a comment from Cecile Pradhan. So with this, uh, uh, please start the presentation. Good day for all and welcome to my presentation. I'm Anupama Adhikari from Sri Lankan team. Today I would like to talk to you about moldy fish processing in southern Sri Lanka. Let's just start with the introduction. Moldy fish in Sri Lanka similar in use to Southeast Asia's dried shrimp, dried anchovies and shrimp paste. It is called Umbelkadin Singhalis and Masi Intramir. Many recipes can be made using small amounts of moldy fish. Tuna types are commonly used for processing, especially skipjack tuna yellowfin tuna and frigate tuna. According to availability, Indian scat and big eye scat are also using for processing. Moving on to processing steps, generally deheading, cleaning, boiling and splitting are practiced. After splitting two to four parts, then smoking and drying are completed. Finally, final products sent to marketplaces. Processing method can divide into two. It is traditional and modern method. Traditional method had practiced many years ago and modern one is the present procedure they practice when processing moldy fish. This slide shows the moldy fish processing areas in southern province. Those are Kotegoda, Pudavala, Dondra and Gandhara. And this one shows the raw material supplies and trading areas. Mirissa, Dondra and Kudavella are the raw material supply areas. Gold and Mathra act as both purchasing and selling sites. Sites, rest of other areas are selling sites. Raw material suppliers, transporters, processors, traders and consumers are the main actors in the moldy fish processing value chain. Take a look at this figure. This is gendered moldy fish value chain in southern. Fishing, transporting and trading in northern market dominating by men, while processing and local market dominating by women. According to calculation, in many small scale processing enterprises, owners are women and also many workers are women. Both men and women engage with different processing tasks. As a result, deheading dominated by men and other tasks dominated by women. Moving on to pay disparities, tasks of female and male workers are different. Women work more days and long hours per day than men. However, men receive higher daily payment for their works than women. Throughout the value chain, value addition can be seen. 
in process 11 cambos cinnamon leaves and curry leaves at based on availability processing volume and market price in wholesale level sorting and grading and retailer level packaging and bottling are practice in secondary processing ready to eat products chili paste and animal feed preparation noted I will end this presentation with quote said by female processor in court together. It shows what she think about moldy fish processing. These are few references. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello all. I am MD Mahfuzha Rahman, a PhD candidate at the University of Manitoba, welcoming you all to my presentation titled Asad Guns Dried Fish Market, Actors Relations and Challenges. This presentation is going to unveil the critical activities performed in Asad Khan's diet fish market and examine the power relations of, of its actors. Asad Khan's diet fish market is the largest wholesale diet fish market in Bangladesh, comprised of 44 Arads and 279 wholesale shop. Arudars are the commission agent who arranges an auction of diet fish on behalf of the producers. Conversely, Wholesalers buy dead fish for Marath through auction. Dead fish producer cannot sell their products directly to the wholesalers. They are bound to sell their products through any of their 44 Arots. Arots charges 6 to maximum 20% commission on the products sold through auction. The Arots decide the product base and sale prices. The producer have zero role in the auction. Therefore, any disagreement with the Arots over auction or product's price has severe consequences for the producer. If any producer disagree with arrows over dead fish price or auction, the auction will be stopped immediately and the producer has to leave the arrows. Arrows in Asad Gunz usually do not arrange the auction for producers who are denied by any of the arrows in Asad Gunz. Therefore, denial by any arrows auctioning a producer products means denial by all adults and losing access to the largest market. In auction, they follow a year mark practice where the buyers offer price silently to the year of Arudar's man. No buyer can know another buyer's offers. This year mark auction practice allows the Arudar's to control the auction, give advantage deciding who to sell or not. The buyer or participant of the auction are listed wholesaler of Asad Guns. Anyone unlisted cannot participate in the auction. Sometimes the buyer wholesaler tries to influence the auction by setting up the maximum price of product among themselves before starting the auction. The auction winner paid the price to the others, not to the producers. They pay it in installment twice a week and without interest. The weekly installment is 6,000 taka for the product worth 100,000 taka. On the other hand, the Arudars paid the dried fish producer one third of the total price of his products in cash on the auction day, and rest of the money is paid in a late dated check, usually two to three months late. The producers have no other choice but accept it, despite it being against their interest. Since the producer need cash for the next installment of production, they sell the check to the check merchant. Usually these merchants are the relatives of the Arodars and wholesalers, and sometimes influential employees of the Arodars and wholesale shop. Late dated check is another way to exploit the producer. For every 100,000 taka, the producer has to give 2,500 taka to the check merchant. The amount could be higher if the check payment date is longer. Thus, the producer are exploited multiple times selling their products in Asad Guns. As a result, the diet fish producer are increasingly getting trapped in the Arudar Czech business syndicate. One of the diet fish producers in Cox's Bazaar stated that many of us are renowned businesses and respected in our community, but we have zero value once we reached Asad Guns with our products. It is the Arudars and their syndicate who decide our product's price and our fate. No outsider can become an Arodars and wholesaler in Asad Guns. The informal rules of the Arodar and Wholesaler Association allow only the family members and close relatives of the current Arodars and wholesaler to become a wholesaler or Arodars. 
which ensure the continuation of existing power structure in Assad Guns. There is no simple and single short solution to overcome the vulnerability of dead fish producers in Assad Guns dead fish market. Rather, it requires effective involvement of respective government institution and active participation of the actors in finding the solution. Thank you all for hearing me. We provide a broad overview of the dried fish processing activity in the Western Indian state of Gujarat in this presentation. Gujarat has several peculiarities as a maritime state. It is the longest coastline of about 1600 kilometers. The marine wetlands in the state are highly diverse with mangroves, coral reefs, beaches, mud flats, tidal flies, etc. Gujarat has remained the largest marine fish producing state for many years and a leading exporter of marine fish. However, curiously, across all the maritime states in, this, in the country, consumption of fish is the lowest in Gujarat. About 75% of the population have never consumed fish as per statistics. The state has also the lowest percentage share of fish marketed fresh among all coastal areas. In 2010 and 2020, the percentage share remained 31%, whereas in other states, it varied between 64 and 94%. As a result of all this, Gujarat has emerged as a leading producer and exporter of processed fish in India, including dried fish. As per the available data, dried fish formed close to 65% of the preserved and processed commodities within the state in 2019-20. The data on disposition of fish catch for the same year suggests that 60% of the fish catch in the state went into either curing or reduction. We have undertaken scoping studies along the different marine uh, coastal systems and one uh, freshwater system. Jafrabad, Mundra on the Kutch coast, Veraval, which is the largest uh, fishing port of the state, and Nalsarovar, which is the largest freshwater lake in Gujarat, are the sites that we studied as uh, for the scoping. And these are highly diverse uh, systems. Jafrabad fishery is dominated by a single variety that is Bopal duck. Mainly small-scale producers from Kharwa Koli communities are involved in fishing. Uh, Mundra uh, coast on, on Kutch uh, coast uh, produce limited, mainly low-value varieties of fish. Artisanal fishers belonging to Vagir Muslim community are the fish producers and processors there. At Veraval, different size production units handling several varieties of fish can be seen. Small processes also coexist. And uh, you also find representation from different regions and communities uh, in this uh, kind of, you know, in this in this area. And in Nalsarovar, fishers and fish processors belong to a particularly vulnerable tribal group called Pathars. Irrespective of the size of the unit, drying is very labor intensive. Family labor is very critical. 80% of the small units depend exclusively on family labor in our study. Women constitute 80 to 100% of the family labor in post-harvest activities in the marine sector and 50% in the freshwater sector. In Veraval, women also play a very major role in retailing dried fish. Dried fish from Gujarat is sold mainly to the local markets of Maharashtra, Assam, Tripura, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and Uttar Pradesh. Exports are mainly to Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, Nepal, Dubai, Mauritius, Oman, Vietnam, and Maldives. The market for dried fish functions through a network of aggregators and commission agents. They are the critical actors in the prison system who connect the different nodes, transmit the demand signals, and facilitate flow of financial resources through the supply chain. Multiple payment system coexists against advance on credit and by payment in cash. Middlemen like commission agents hold enormous power in the market, but they are not legitimized by any formal sanctions by the state like a license. Overall decline in the, scale, in the scale of production and volume of sales is reported by many processors in the study. Increased prices and negligible investment in upgrading processes, processes help maintain profitability. Lack of investment in process upgradation has obvious impact on quality. A visual survey of drying yards, cutting and washing areas and storage area revealed that quality is not adequately maintained in most of the units. In short, Dried fish sector in Gujarat is caught in a low road strategy of managing costs and profits by compromising quality. There are many other challenges to the sustainability of dried fish business in the long run. 
A climate variability and occurrence of extreme climate events are emerging as a very major dampener. Failure in arrangements of governance like overfishing and fishing of juveniles has been reported by many. The economics of fishing and fish processing has changed significantly over the past years. The cost of fishing and fish processing has risen significantly and many fish varieties traditionally available for drying are now converted uh, or diverted towards other types of processing like making fish paste and fish meal or oil. More importantly, the policy priorities have shifted decisively in favor of coastal industrialization, which has led to displacement of traditional fishers as it happened in Kutch and conflict between goals like environmental conservation, for instance, and livelihood security of traditional fishers around the freshwater systems. Thank you. On behalf of all the colleagues of the DFM Kerala team, I am presenting some of the leads from the scoping study being carried out by us, where we are trying to specifically look at the involvement of women in dry fish production. We find that over time there has been a transition in their participation in the sector from what once was majorly a women's activity, their roles are transitioning to other forms which will be discussed. Drying and other forms of preservation, as we know, are have been practiced since ages, so that excess after consuming fresh would be actually stored for late use. And we also know that women dominated these activities, whether it was for marketing locally or for uh, traditionally processing and storing it. In our scoping work, we found that today mainly women's involvement was through very small scale subsistence uh, production, where they did that independently. They also were hired labor where both we had local uh, women uh, who were hired as well as migrant women from neighboring states who were hired as labor. And they have, they're also being contracted to do fish drying for others. In Kasargod in North Kerala, we found women actually procured bycatch uh, from trawl boats for which they paid about uh, rupees 20 a basket. Uh, roughly about one rupee per kilo. And they dried this on the waysides near the harbor, very near the harbor. And once this was dried, the women actually sorted out uh, small edible fish like uh, shrimp and false pony from the lot, which they sold locally. And the rest was bundled into sacks and sold to two Kasargod based traders uh, who procured it and then later uh, sent it to meal industry, meal, uh, fish meal plants in, in either of states. So for uh, one sack of uh, dried fish, a dried bycatch, they got about rupees 180. And uh, actually we found that the women who are involved in this activity were old, older women, about 60 to 70 years of age. They had been doing this activity since their childhood. And uh, at that time it was for human consumption, drying for human consumption. But now since that is becoming increasingly difficult for these women, they are doing, uh, they are actually procuring bycatch and drying it for the meal industry. And also uh, out of the bycatch, if they're able to get some fish, which they can sell locally, they're doing that. In places like uh, Munambam in Ernakulam, which is in central Kerala, we found that there are a lot of curing yards uh, adjacent and near the harbor which are all operated by men so the men participated in the auction and they procured fresh fish uh, which they eventually use for curing and drying uh, in in the uh, curing yards uh, of these uh, operated by these men we had women uh, as laborers uh, the fish was actually transported to these curing yards and the women actually graded, cleaned, and de-gutted the fish, and then uh, went on to uh, salt cure it and store it in uh, coconut leaf uh, baskets. Uh, the bigger uh, plastic crates uh, when salting was to be done, that was mostly done by men. And there was a wage differential between men and women. Well, women got about 500 to 700 rupees per day as wages. The men received 700 to 1,000 rupees per day as wages. Also, we found two types of uh, 
employment here. One was like women were permanently employed uh, and they were given wages on a monthly basis or a weekly basis. And also when there is excess fish, we found that uh, other women from the neighborhood, from the vicinity came and uh, were uh, doing part-time work uh, in these curing yards. Also, uh, in we found migrant women from neighboring states like Tamil Nadu. Actually, they migrated along with their husbands in search of work. And they were also sort of hired in these curing yards for carrying out curing and drying activities. Another type of activity that we found in a coastal village in Alapura district, which is in South Kerala, was that women were engaged uh, by uh, other, other people for uh, or sort of contracted for doing drying, uh, drying for them. So uh, species like anchovies, uh, sardines, and mackerels were procured by these sales agents and given to these women, and they dried it for them in their uh, backyards or near in beaches near their uh, households. Uh, they received a fixed price, like 200 rupees per box of fresh fish was uh, sort of the wages, if you can call it that, uh, was what was given to these women. Uh, they had no risk whatsoever for each box of fresh fish. They received the fixed price. They just had to dry it for them and uh, give it to them. All the uh, loading, unloading, and filling into sacks, etc., was done by hired labor of the sales agents, and the women had no obligation to do this for them. They only had to dry the fish and give it to them. These women all belong to fishing community, uh, Latin Christians in faith and uh, their husbands are fishermen and they used to actually do uh, fresh fish marketing and dried fish production and marketing earlier. So now they are contracted by these sales agents to do the drying for them. So they are not uh, actually affected by any fluctuations of price of fish or the wages of a light worker and they get a fixed income for uh, whatever fish they can buy. So these are the four uh, different uh, types of engagement of women that we found in uh, the scoping study that we did in Kerala. Thank you very much. Three minutes, a social economy of dried fish in Southeast Asia. This draws uh, heavily on the scoping studies conducted by DFM in Thailand, uh, Myanmar, where you can see the scoping activities illustrated on the left. Cambodia, and also some supplementary information from the Philippines and secondary sources. So the first uh, observation is that there's very patchy uh, data on the stocks um, of fish that are used for drying, uh, but there's very common perceptions and anecdotal evidence of catch declines throughout the region. Occasionally, there's some more um, robust data points, such as you can see here, uh, illustrated from Myanmar, but typically there's a, a big lack of uh, sort of stock assessment or fishery dependent data on the stocks used for drying. Partial exception being Thailand where um, there's very good data on uh, anchovy fisheries, for example. Uh, as you can see illustrated here, dried fish comes in a, a vast diversity of forms, uh, sold in a wide range of settings also. Um, but despite this diversity, there are some commonalities in the sort of associations of uh, dried fish as food. Um, so in, in some circumstances, thought of as a typical food of the poor, very widely used as a flavor enhancer, very widely seen as a comfort food, uh, and increasingly also um, sold in the form of high-end snacks. As we see illustrated in this uh, set of pictures, there are important gender divisions of labor across different segments of the value chain and oftentimes also generational divisions of labor. Uh, migrant workers are very common alongside resident workers and business owners, but the dynamics of the interactions between these groups are often uh, not well known. Uh, we see that dry fish can be very culturally significant. So these pictures are actually from Penang in Malaysia, uh, a world heritage city and dried fish production and consumption here has sort of entered the, the kind of cultural imagination of, of what this, this place means. So to conclude, we have very patchy information uh, through, throughout the region. Uh, we see lots of inter and also intra-country variation 
in terms of products, practices and preferences associated with dried fish, but also many common tendencies that hold across the region. Um, dried fish is very important, uh, but often overlooked, uh, partly we think because it's so deeply integrated into the rhythms of everyday life that it tends to go unremarked or forgotten. Um, Dried fish is perceived as a the traditional sector of product, but it's also proven surprisingly dynamic. So we have both continuity and change. And this gives rise to questions about whether in the future it will persist or whether there will be obsolescence. And if so, uh, in what forms? Thank you. Synthesizing some of the findings from the scoping phase uh, done in South, South Asia, we tried to answer a few questions like what are the main species that were dried, what are the methods of processing used, and what roles men and women played, and what were their vulnerabilities, etc. So several species are used for drying in India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. The main ones are anchovies, sardines, and mackerel, besides Hilsa shad, Bombay duck, sole, and shrimp. Catches, as we see, have been fluctuating with seasons of high and low. But basically, a decline has been reported from all the countries. Sizes of fishing units have shown an increase, and climate change induced factors are also affecting catches. Multiple agencies impact and exercise control over fishing and processing activities, and traditional arrangements regulating drying activity also simultaneously exist, as mostly drying is carried out on common property or private leased lands. Sun drying on beaches is still the most common method of drying. Curing, fermentation is done in concrete tanks, barrels, or in earthen pots. Women continue to play major roles, but are increasingly being reduced to paid or unpaid labor rather than operators, with gender disparity even seen in wages being given to them. Consumer preference also shows wide variation, falling due to concerns of safety, and also availability of alternatives. But also, on the other hand, it has been positively impacted due to new and better packaged products that are now available, especially in urban supermarkets. Uncertainties and catches, declining coastal lands for drying, unfavorable sales arrangements are all affecting dried fish production and are increasing the vulnerability of people involved in the sector. However, dried fish continues to have economic, nutritional, and cultural significance because it's a source of income and nutritional security for households engaged in its production. And also in several cultures, it has religious and customary significance. In conclusion, there are several similarities in the region along with distinct variations. Dried small marine fish are important economically, socially, culturally, and nutritionally in South Asia. And ecological changes will have short and long-term impacts on fish available for drying as there are competing uses of the resource. There are several methods of processing, mostly traditional, which needs improvement from the point of view of food safety. Women continue to play significant roles, but remain largely voiceless and vulnerable. Uh, open drying is still the most common traditional drying method that's used. Uh, while taste is a rather subjective dimension, but quality and nutrition are definitely compromised if dried in the open, as there can be contamination. That's why these platforms are being advocated, and processors themselves are going for mats and other platforms. Thank you. Myself, Agilit Basu, uh, District Fisherman Youth Welfare Association, Vishakapatnam, Andhra Pradesh, India. Perspective of the small scale women fish processes of northern coastal Andhra India. So, dried fish traditionally important for the small scale fishing economy in ensuring the food and the nutritional security of large segments, population, and in supporting wide range of livelihoods. Over the last three decades, there have been a number of changes affecting this sector, those happening within this sector. Changes are general external factors 
forces importing of the sector changes arising out broader social and economic trends and additional layer of changes in brought on by climate change and natural disasters. DFIWA undertook this study to facilitate the organization to move from immediate development interventions towards more strategic long-term programs. Support from dried fish matters making up the social economic dried fish in South and Southeast Asia for enhanced well-being and nutrition being implemented by the University of Manitoba, Canada with support from Social Science and Humanities Research Council, DFIWA Corpus Fund as members voluntary donations and fresh fish sellers who use left fish from day sale for converting to dried fish fighting to dried fish making only when it is unavoidable naturally the quantities of dried fish produced in this segment are small and women sell them to alongside with next batch of fresh fish to the same customers fresh fish and dried fish sellers the women switch opportunistically between dried fish and fresh and fresh fish seasonally and are depending on the availability of the practical particular spices medium scale dried fish processors these are women who might at one of the have depend on the surplus local landings for drying but who now source their supplies from the fishing arbors are less frequently from the neighboring fish landing centers in Vishapatnu and Srikakulam Kakinada surrounding areas. Large scale dried fish and fish meal product producers and traders involved in round the year operations making and selling dried fish for human consumption work in villages and large fishing fleets operating small mess gillnets for small scale pelagic spices and beach scenes are increased near fishing arbors where fish is abundantly available. Fish meal producers mainly present at the fishing arbors tend to buy cheaper but bulk landed fish from the mechanized and motorized boats and make into the fish meal for sale to poultry and aquaculture farmers. One sellers purchase of full processed fish and large scale operations from fishing arbors and used to onward sale. Even Andhra Pradesh, a lot of a lot of beach scene or ring scene nets also. They are catching more catching in ring scene and uh, dry fish is women smoked onboard processors crew members who make dried fish of premium quality. Smoked fish producers prevalent Prevalent in the Godavari Delta, most processors are small scale operations. Also, to note, processing assistants, ancillary supplier services, material and laborers, other value chain actors beyond fishing community. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity within three minutes. Thank you very much. If, if, if you more time, definitely I will give more information. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much. Now we would like to invite uh, Cecil Pradhan for comments. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Kyoko. And thanks, uh, Anupama, Mafuz, Tara, Nikita, Belton, uh, Ben, and Dasu for actually raising so important and pertinent issues, uh, so diverse kind of issues in the value chain, dried fish value chain. That sets really uh, a nice ground for me to reflect on different elements that is actually coming into this value chain discussions now. Um, what I would like to do in five minutes time, I would outline some critical elements that is seen across the table and some specific elements that is seen in some areas. At the same time, I will leave with some questions that we need to really collectively uh, work on in future to, to really, if you want to see uh, dried fish from a perspective of uh, upstream value chain actors. So uh, having said this, I see, I found all these presentations brought very interesting dimensions. One, one thing was very clear is like dried fish is quite diverse. If you see Sri Lankan uh, case, uh, Gujarat case, uh, uh, Myanmar case, Bangladesh case. So these are all diverse and relational, highly place-based. 
and there is also continuous adaptations happening at all levels so if sri lankan case we say technology adaptation is happening as a at a local house level local levels to adaptation ha happening at the market level so continuous adaptation is happening at all level the second critical element which i saw is like uh, there is whole dispersed production in in the dried space with large number of actually self employment self employed family based enterprises so so this sector is dominated and by this small and dispersed uh, kind of uh, producers and which has missed identity and dasu's presentation and many other presentation i read the missed identity and swapping of roles and they take different roles at different point of time just to um uh to maintain because they operate in a very subsistence level so so there is a mixed identity in that uh, there is also strong um, we find there is a across the presentations from kerala to to gujarat to uh, everywhere we found there is a strong gendered division of labor in, in, in terms of and there is also a strong gender disparity at the same time and there is ever changing labor relationship that has been experienced from myanmar case it is very clearly evident myanmar and in fact um, from south india case that there is a whole uh, ever changing labor dynamics happening in the sector and then there is there is a whole um, still there is a strong emphasis in commodity um which is commodity perspective into this value chain which is not necessarily integrating the whole uh, resource space as a critical element and uh, that is creating a, a, a bigger challenge and we see that all the presentation in fact highlighted that reducing catch has its own implications in the all level of factors in the value chain and uh, that uh, there is a this uh, commodity chain also Uh, pushing a quest for profit and that is leading to unequal access and control uh, over the the value chain by different actors and and the investment and time and money investment is becoming uh, too i think skewed in the whole process um there is also we found there is a strong vertical and horizontal integration happening at the lower end value chain with thanks to mafus to raise those kind of issues where uh, where if we really think from a market system perspective yeah. so there are two uh, kind of uh, uh, things are emerging in this systems one is like corporate integration uh, of uh, value chain and the second one is adjusted integration if we see a uh, vertical integration in this two what is happening that the bigger players are also taking control from the sea to market uh, by bringing in mechanized investing in mechanized sector processing and then trading retailing and that is a corporate way of looking at it and the other way is like one channel player is becoming much dominant and and they are actually coming together to determine the price the 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 self esteem the kind of power in the market and that's what uh, is very clearly evident in case of aradhars middlemen sales agents in south india middlemen gujarat aradhar in in bangladesh so those kind of issues are very pertinent and also there is a horizontal integration happening at that level like capital groups the like banks finance these aradhars have their own financing arrangements so so those horizontal integrations are happening at a lower end level and that is actually making this whole value chain is more extractive and exploitative for the uh, upper end uh, value stream players so there is also a rising cost uh, okay i one minute <laughs> okay uh, so there is also a rising cost and that cost um, uh it's it's actually shaping the behavior uh, highly uh, de declining catch and then also it is uh, it is actually prompting for i saw from kerala uh, the the whole focus on by catch and by catch economy is becoming and that is anyway leading to uh, again uh, the vicious cycle of low production habitat destruction and those kind of things so so that is uh, what uh, the key highlights i see is coming from this presentation and my work in south india in east india so i live with a three four critical questions that raise me three for one is that uh, the whole question of uh, uh, resources being actually resource based in fisheries is being perceived as a support or inbound logistics function in the dried fish value chain is it that 
So if that is so critical to save the bee conduct structure in this, can't, can we also re-look at the structure of valogen by placing the resource at the center? That, that gives a new question, raises new questions to tenure access and those issues. The second uh, major issue is that uh, the dynamics in vertical and horizontal linkages, that is very critical, uh, which actually needs to be thought for me, uh, should we look at from the capital uh, market perspective or should we look at from the well-being perspective? That we need to really think about, well-being of whom and how. So, and the third major question, so we need to probably uh, realign our understanding about uh, this, this this whole value chain conduct is looked at with the, with, the, with the kind of optimization of labor cost risk framework, but the kind of uncertainty from climate, from, the, from market processes is coming. Are we really, uh, and for the interest of the poor, should we really look at from that perspective? Or we shift our kind of a discussion uh, towards uh, looking at uncertainty as an as a, as a area of, of giving rise to new equilibrium. So, uh, and we must also uh, uh, look at, yeah, and the last one is about this whole trans, transdisciplinarity as approach, where, because there are a lot of discussion happened on culturally relevant and, and culturally important food, the subsistence. So how do we really look at these whole cultural elements in the value chain and define the performance of the value chain? by putting redefining value in the dried fish value chain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cecile. Uh, we go to the next step uh, set of presentation. Uh, is, uh, we are going into this dried fish as food. The presenters include Situlin, Noba Almine, uh, Mustafa Hossein, Eric Thrift, and uh, followed by the comments from Ben Belton. Uh, poor Nima Tenakon's um, um, uh, presentation is not going to be aired, but in, then you will get the link at, uh, in chat so you can have the longer version of her presentation there. So uh, please, we will start the presentation. Hello everyone, my name is Ito Lim. I'm going to present about Myanmar Dry Fish Consumption Survey. With the objective to understand the patterns of dry fish consumption in Myanmar, Myanmar Dry Fish Consumption Survey was conducted in eight states and region with 960 participants who are living in the rural areas. This study covered the three geographic zones, Delta and Coastal Region, Central Dry Zone, and the Hilly Region. The study used quantitative survey method. Basically, there are seven types of processed fish in Myanmar. They are dry fish, dry shrimp, small fish, fish or shrimp paste, fish socks, fermented fish, and fermented shrimps. <clears throat> According to the literature review, the annual annual average fish products and Fish consumption in Myanmar is 21 kg, is accounted for 22.6% of total dietary protein consumption. Fish bay, fish sauce, shrimp paste, and dry fish are mostly consumed, and the most popular one is fermented fish in a beet. The annual consumption of dry fish and processed fish product was 6.5 kg per person, and it accounts for 34% of all fish consumption. And the consumption patterns is equally in both rural and urban areas, and the unit price of dry fish is more than doubled than the fresh fish. Here are the key results that we find from our survey. Nearly all households consume processed fish in the past weeks, and the consumption of processed and fresh fish is mainly higher in data and coastal region, and the frequency of consumption of processed fish products is average of 10 times per week and it accounts for 41% of all fish consumption. And the fermented fish is the most consumed one, and dry fish is the third most consumed one. The consumption of dry fish by household was higher in Mon and Bago and moderate in ARD and Zagai, and but low in the Shan North. People living in Mon, Bago, Cayenne and ARD, they produce fish and fish related product by thumbs up only 46% for dry fish. We identified eight categories of fish in our survey 
Uh, there are five categories of fresh fish and 46 species are used for dry fish and five categories are used in dry shrimps and 10 species are used to be fermented and with 11 types of products and 23 species are used for salted fish and 40 species are used for small fish and the another category is king fish and the other fish products are identified. Thank you for your listening. For today's presentation called Shopping for Dried Fish in Thailand, this is based on the initial results of the scoping study that involves literature review, rapid survey of wholesale and retail markets in Bangkok and vicinities, and visits to several key provinces, including data mining from the internet on the e-commerce of dried fish, which is part of my thesis. Dried fish and related products are crucial to Thai economy. Dried fish is readily available at affordable prices, both as uncooked and cooked products and sold in local markets or groceries and convenience stores nationwide. Although COVID-19 does not affect fish, but it has a negative impact to the fish sector, leading to changes in consumer demands, market access, and logistical problems related to transportation and border restrictions. During the COVID-19 pandemic, strict regulations were implemented, which prompted many fishers and seafood vendors to turn to e-commerce to support their livelihoods. Dried anchovy and kapi provide a rich source of calcium, micronutrients, and essential fatty acids, which is important especially for the growing children and lactating women, providing nutritional and health benefits. Additionally, fermentation in kapi making helps enhance the nutritional and functional properties of the food. The word talad means market in Thai, and there are three main dry fish markets in and near Bangkok. Number one market is a popular destination among Thais for fish and seafood products, including fresh and dried. The second market is the new center for trading of all agricultural products from all over the country. And the third market was once the biggest trading center in the 17th and 18th century. Local markets serves as a place for people to buy produce, dried goods, and other necessities, as well as for the interaction with people. Here, price is negotiable, and the local markets vary in terms of size, but they carry similar items from fresh fruit and vegetables to meat, fish, and seafood. The best place to learn about dried fish is going to a local market. Dried fish sold in grocery, convenience stores, and supermarkets are in ready-to-eat packaging and includes information in English and labels showing the ingredients, nutritional values, and that they meet the required health and safety food standard. In some low-end stores, on the other hand, Dried fish are sold in less attractive packages, often without a label and at a lower price. The preliminary assessment shows that the dried fish value chain in Thailand is very diverse and complex, which you will see in this figure. But this presentation will be focused more on the marketing, including using Facebook as a new way of selling dried fish to reach wider customers. The map shows the geographical locations of the dried fish online vendors in Thailand, which is spread all over the country. I followed the ethnography method by Cosinets to capture data from social media, which is Facebook, for this project. The ethnographic data make qualitative investigation possible for my empirical virtual study, which would have been difficult for me going to Thailand in the middle of the pandemic. Facebook was chosen because it is the most popular online selling platform in Thailand, and the Facebook vendors sell all kinds of dried fish. The ethnographic data obtained by following 61 Facebook vendors or pages showed that online dried fish selling in Thailand has started more than 10 years ago. Many are created in 2017 and online vendors continue to appear each year. The largest Facebook vendor in terms of following have almost 2 million followers and was created only in 2018. Most of the Facebook vendors are very practical and employ both business-to-business -business and business-to-consumer type of business model to cater the widest consumer market possible. This is supported on the nature of their business, as majority do both wholesaling and retailing. Aside from their Facebook shop page, most of the vendors have their physical stores, which are often located in the local markets. 
In order to utilize most of Facebook's shopping experience, almost half of the online vendors sell their products using Facebook's live streaming app, which is helpful in increasing their sales by interacting with their buyers live. The preliminary results show that Drive Fish Value Chain is diverse and complex, and the increasing number of online vendors imply a significant change in the flow of dry fish markets. In addition, Facebook provides small-scale entrepreneurs with social capital to grow their business while providing consumers convenient access to healthy and affordable food. Finally, we hope that the results will guide policymakers creating appropriate policies for the dried fish value chain as well as inspire social entrepreneurs and provide overall awareness about dried fish. My name is Nova Almine. I am a master's student at Memorial University of Newfoundland in Canada. I am presenting in behalf of the DFM Thai team led by Dr. Ratuna Chuinpegdi. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, this is Professor Mustafa Hussein from Bangladesh Agriculture University. Today I'm going to talk about microplastics and food safety issues. Particularly, the presence of microplastic in fish, with special emphasis on dried fish. The source of microplastics include microfibers from clothing, microbeds, and fillets, from clean jars to fish and other industrial products. Secondary microplastic may come from bottles, plastic containers, tires, packaging and shipping materials, fishing nets, plastic bags, and array of other products. The first synthetic plastic known as bakelite was produced in 1907. Since then, the microplastic production is increasing, and in 2018, the world produced 359 million metric tons of plastic. Today, about 7.8 billion metric tons of plastics in the world more than 1 tons of plastic per person living in the planet Earth today. Global production of plastic will continue to rise and the ultimate destination of most plastics is the marine environment. Evidence of marine PM2 pollution has been growing rapidly as a result and now almost all the oceans and bays and rivers and flood plains are full of microplastics. Worldwide, Numerous studies have detected amphibians in fish, crustacean, bivalves, zooplankton, and other aquatic organisms. Harmful effects of microplastic ingestion include physiological injury, inflammation, blockage of the digestive tract, and cellular toxicity in, in many organisms. Bangladesh has more than 3,000 small and large plastic manufacturing companies. The daily production of plastic in this country now stands about 3,000 tons. Plastic waste accumulates largely affect the marine ecosystem and biota of the Bay of Bengal and the fish and fisheries of the many rivers, flood plains, and other aquatic water bodies of Bangladesh. Dried fish matter projects is a multi-country consortium project funded by Social Science and Human Resources. Research Council of Canada, led by Department of Anthropology, University of Manitoba, and co-partners uh, co from Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Thailand, a number of other countries and institutes. And the project has been working on the dry fish sector of the region. Now, why dry fish is important? The sector has long been playing a vital role in the economy of Bangladesh and a number of other countries. It is of high demand and also exported to overseas markets, particularly among the non-resident Bangladeshi diaspora in, in the Middle East, Malaysia, America, UK, and a number of other countries. Now, in our study, we collected two most commonly consumed dry fish, known as Bombay duck and Ribbon fish, from two different parts, the southwest and southeast coast of Bangladesh known as Kuakata and Cox's water. In our experiment, we followed the typical protocol of extracting microplastics from the dry fish. This included collection of raw sample, removal of moisture, grinding, filtration, and then chemical digestion to extract the microplastics. And we use the FPR analysis to identify the polymer. What we found is surprising 
the number of microplastics in each gram of the trichy or like 30 to 40 particles per gram. And we found microwaves, foams, fillets, films, fragments, fiber. And the polymer oils, the microplastic we found was polyethylene, polystyrene, and polyamide. Now the reason behind the high concentration of microplastics in the dry fruit we examined was it takes about two to six kg of fresh fruit to produce one kg of dry fruit. And in case of particular the bombeta, which is water acid, it took more than six kg of fish to produce one kg of dry fruit. We published a paper in Venin Pollution Bulletin. Now, findings are very significant given that millions of people in Bangladesh and other countries regularly consume dry products, and the country is producing increased quantities of plastics. The effect on many millions of consumers of regularly ingesting microplastic with dried fish are today unknown. Now, the broader issue globally, often dried fish are usually consumed in their entirety and may be responsible for the trophic transfer of significant amount of microplastic to the consumer body. Scientific understandings of the sources, exposure to by accumulation of and resulting toxic effects of microplastics on the marine ecosystems and biota and the and in humans are limited. Finally, the empty found in dried fish in our study and the potential harm they may cause to health of consumers should prompt action by the authorities to begin cleaning up aquatic habitats and monitoring ways the diet fish is produced and consumed. Further scientific studies a must to bring the knowledge gap to support the twofold objectives of sustaining consumption of aquatic feeds and safeguarding consumers from possible health risks posed by the microplastic. Hello everyone, my name is Eric Thrift and together with my colleagues from the Dried Fish Matters project, I recently worked on a comprehensive survey of the research literature on dried fish. One thing really stands out in this survey. When we look at everything that has been published in English that is directly about dried fish, we find that over 70% of all publications are from the area of food science. This includes research from the disciplines of food chemistry, food microbiology, food safety, and food engineering. The McGill University Food Science Program defines this area as a multidisciplinary field involving chemistry, biochemistry, nutrition, microbiology, and engineering to give one the scientific knowledge to solve real problems associated with the many facets of the food system. Basically, using science and engineering to solve technical problems related to food. When we listed the journals that have published three or more articles since 2005 concerning dried fish, we found all but two were dedicated to food science disciplines. The two exceptions were the Journal of Ethnic Foods, which publishes a mixture of technical and descriptive reports, and the Journal of Maritime Archaeology. Humanities journals are not represented at all. Most of this food science research involves either nutrient or microbiological analysis of existing products. Nutrient analysis research typically profiles the nutritional content of products available in local markets. In general, this research confirms the value of dried fish in meeting the nutritional needs of people around the world. Some studies have also tested the impacts of different storage and processing methods on nutritional profiles, suggesting ways of enhancing nutritional quality through processing improvements. Food quality analyses have largely focused on the various forms of contamination that affect traditionally produced dried fish. Consumer products have been found to be contaminated with heavy metals such as lead and mercury or microplastics. Hazardous pesticides including banned toxins such as DDT and dichlorovos are still applied directly to fish by some processors and traders to prevent losses due to blowfly and beetle infestations. These chemicals continue to be found in samples of dried fish that are sold for human consumption. Microbiological studies have identified unsafe bacteria or fungi in commercially available products from local markets. This research shows that risks can be reduced by controlling storage temperature, using sto solar dryers, or using safer ingredients and sanitary equipment. Food scientists have tested various new products and processing technologies designed to achieve better food safety or nutritional parameters than traditional equivalents. But, Technical interventions such as elevated racks, 
solar dryers, improved recipes, and low-risk pesticides have been promoted since the 1970s at least, with almost no long-term adoption by dried fish processors. We have the food science data to identify safe and nutritious dried fish, but we don't have clear evidence of what makes safe and nutritious dried fish processing methods popular and acceptable to producers. This is where social science research on dried fish value chains can help. Thank you very much. May I invite Ben Belton for comments? Uh, thank you, Kyoko. And uh, thanks to all the presenters and teams involved for these uh, very interesting set of presentations uh, on the theme of dried fish as food. Um, and I'd just like to remind you that there's one more presentation available on demand, which I'd encourage you to watch as well. Uh, so we started off uh, with a study from DFM Myanmar presented by C. Tu Lin. And this uh, illustrates beautifully the incredible diversity of dried fish in Myanmar, both in terms of the different types of processed products, but also the huge number of species consumed, which I think total more than, more than 60 across all the products. Um, we saw that there are different product forms preferred in different zones of the country, perhaps reflecting differences in local environments and the distribution of uh, aquatic species. And that may have translated over time into different cultural preferences emerging in different places. Um, the high frequency of dry fish consumption is really striking. So consumed um, 10 times a week on average. And that really underlines the centrality of dried fish in the diet, both uh, in terms of nutrition, but also the place that they occupy uh, in the cuisine. Um, also, the quantities of dried fish consumption uh, that, that emerged out of these surveys were actually a lot higher than um, are reported in the general literature. Um, and that leads to interesting methodological questions about the accuracy of different types of consumption survey and how best to capture this information on food consumption. And I think that could give rise to a really important new set of research questions for DFM. Um, second of all, we had a fascinating study from Thailand. Um, and as uh, the presenter Nova Alamina stated, the best place to learn about dried fish is by going to the local market. But in this case, the team uh, faced difficulties due to COVID-19. And so this um, made them turn to this, uh, this fascinating uh, netnography technique um, where they studied uh, online fish retailers uh, on Facebook. Um, so it's noteworthy here that these new businesses, as well as selling online, also have uh, physical sh shops. So the digital sales haven't completely replaced sort of traditional uh, shops. Um, and also by live streaming, sellers can interact directly with their customers as much as they might do in a physical market. Um, and so the emergence of many of these vendors is really starting to reshape the structure of the dried fish value chain in Thailand. Uh, from Bangladesh, we heard about uh, the, the results from one of the first ever studies of microplastic contamination in dried fish presented by Mustafa Hussein. And that uh, revealed really high levels of microplastic contamination in, in the two most common marine uh, dried fish species harvested in, in the Bay of Bengal. Um, so as the presentation highlighted at the moment, the bioaccumulation mechanisms for microplastics in the food chain uh, are not well understood. Um, and neither are the potential dangers of in ingestion of microplastics by humans or by aquatic animals. So we don't know exactly what the implications of these findings are, but they do give us cause for concern, um, especially because dried fish are typically consumed whole, including the digestive tract where many of the, the microplastics are found. And so this is another important area for research to understand the uh, health implications of this. Um, then finally, uh, from DFM headquarters, we had Eric Thrift um, presenting uh, uh, the results on, uh, from a global review of the dried fish literature, um, which finds that this literature is, really, literature is dominated by publications uh, from food science. Uh, so using uh, science and engineering to solve technical problems related to food. Um, and so many of these studies uh, relate to nutrients or microbiological analysis. Um, and they, they confirm again, the importance of dried fish for nutrition. 
but there are also um, many analyses of contaminants, so heavy metals, pesticides, bacteria, fungi, etc. Um, a lot of these studies suggest that some of these risks could be reduced by improving processing techniques, uh, but the uptake of techniques is typically very poor. So that really understand, uh, underlines the need for more social science research to understand the reasons why improvements might not take place or under which circumstances they might happen and what kind of consequences they might have for the different groups of people involved. Um, and then finally, not, not in the session, but in our on-demand section of presentations, we had a great example uh, from Panema uh, Tanakun from uh, University of Rihanna in Sri Lanka of such a food science approach to the study of dried fish. Um, and so her study compared the proximate composition, uh, but also salt peroxide histamine levels, uh, fungal species and the sensory properties of uh, several different dried fish products uh, from uh, Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, most of these parameters were, were found to be within acceptable ranges and therefore uh, safe to consume. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ben. So I uh, will now go to the last session on uh, examining improvement in dried fish social economies. This session, the uh, presenters will include Mahed Chaudhary, uh, Milza, uh, Milza Deslima, and Derek Johnson. We also have two on-demand uh, uh, videos available from uh, Laktima Ghosh on the political economy of dried fish and Amalendu Jyotishi uh, of value chain, uh, dried fish value chain in Karnataka. So please uh, have a look at those videos as well. So please, we can start the presentation. Hello, I'm Mahesh Choudhury. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Canada. In this presentation, we will share some of the preliminary findings from the Working Group 3 on Policy, Governance and Development for the Project Dried Fish Matters, funded by Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada at the University of Manitoba. For this presentation, we will focus on policies, governance and development in small-scale fisheries with special reference to dry fish sector in, in six Southeast, South and Southeast Asian countries. What we found in the literature is that there is a lack of attention on policy and governance in dry fish literature and mostly and mostly the literature considers uh, policy as part of governance. What we argue is that the policy governance and development are, are there are some overlaps, they are interconnected but they are distinct. The objective of this presentation is to demonstrate conceptually the interconnection and overlaps between policy governance and development map policy landscape for those six, six countries in uh, these six countries and also uh, to, to examine governance development for dry fish sector. Now the question is why dried fish? So this table, re this, this table represents that a good portion of the fish captures are dried, fermented and salted. It has nutritional, cultural and other values. It creates employment. So this is why we argue that Dry fish sector need, needs special attention in policy governance and development and should be considered as a separate sector. When it comes to policy, the key questions here are how policy documents frames development, how policy documents frame governance, what are, who are the actors, what, what are the drivers, are policy documents explicit on dry fish sectors. In terms of governance, the key question is governance of what? And in case of governance, that, is, that institution is a key. And when it comes to development, development can be uh, development can take sectoral approach or GDP-centered approach, or it can take a people-centered or, or well-being-centered approach. This table represents the interconnection and overlaps um, among policy governance and development. For example, in terms of mode. Policy is a meta guideline. Track in governance is sort of problem solving and opportunity creation, and developing is sort of normative goal. There are also the feedback relationship among policy governance and development. This diagram represents the feedback relationship: how policy feedbacks to governance, and how governance feedbacks to development, also to policy. When we map policies of those six countries, we present here for four countries. What we found that 
these policies of those countries are not explicit in terms of dry fish sector there is no direct policy on dry fish uh, dry fish is only marginally uh, mentioned in fishery policies on agricultural policies so what are the key lessons learned the key lessons learned there is no direct policy on dry fish in selected countries lack of alignment between state and national policies lack of scaling up of local knowledge lack of involvement of of experts so it means that because of lack of policy the issue of governance is missing the issue of development is missing there when it comes to governance and development governance of what we say governance of 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 dry fish value chain it should be both vertically and also horizontally and the key key issue is here institution both formal and informal in terms of development what we found is that structural approach to development often creates winners and losers so what requires is also more people centered approach however the policy that guides governance development are missing in most cases and in those selected countries lastly uh, we conclude that the connection among policy governance development remains an unexplored in the literature and dry fish sector re re requires a special attention in policy domain as well thank you everyone the presentation is about dry fish policy of bangladesh to address nutritional consequences of changing preferences I am Mr. Taslima Sultana, Professor, Department of Anthropology, Jahanabad University, Bangladesh. I worked in a team along with my four other colleagues of the department. Besides sun-dried fish, there are many other ways in preserving fish. In Bangladesh, two to eight days are required for drying, depending on the size and species of the fishes. Also, fermented and salted fishes are available. Bangladesh is not only a riverine country, it is also a fish-loving country in terms of production and consumption. The country annually produces nearly 4.5 million tons of fish, 35% of marine catch, 5% of inland open water catch are dried. A total nearly 75,000 tons of dried fish are produced each year. Ecological issues are involved in the whole processing system like catching, washing, cleaning and while salted and dried under the sun. Both marine and freshwater fish stocks used for drying under the ecological stress. All the stakeholders complain that gradually fish supply is lowering in the year with increasing amount of fishing. The food and nutrition of hundreds of thousands of people rely on the sector. As the fish farming and poultry sector are booming, more dried fish are being supplied to the fish or poultry feed. As a result, less supplies are remain for human consumption while consumption of dried fish has been increased. This is creating the price hike for the poor and middle class consumers. Alarmingly, dried fish in many cases are processed in an unhygienic condition and chemical and pesticides are mixed in a wet weather condition to protect the product from the fly infestation. Mainly women and children work in the processing phase. Bonded child labor is common in the marine drying fish. Lack of toilet drinking water facilities, strong sunshine, long working hours makes a difficult working condition. Though children and women are considered as hard working, they are less paid. On the other hand, nearly 1 million Rohingya refugees from neighboring Myanmar are now living in Bangladesh. They are now involved in marine brine fish processing zone at Cox's Bazar and Technop, competing with the native women and lowering the wages further. There are a number of policies in the country to minimize ecological implication of fish stock, to prevent child labor and protect women and bonded labor. However, in many cases, these rules and regulations are not applied properly. As a result, people suffer. Price of dried fish does not depend on the dried fish producers. Rather, Involvement of different kinds of middlemen increases the price in the market. As a result, 
poor consumers suffer. The policy should 1. Address the need of training for workers and owners of dried fish processing farms to protect the ecological balance. 2. Ensure a system that employ enough manpower for overseeing the use of chemicals and pesticides in the dried fish to protect them from the flying infestations. Moreover, policy should include dried fish processing zone as a hazardous workplace for children for stopping possible chemical exposures. Gender differences including ethnic differences in paying wages should be addressed in the policy document to end the pay gap between men and women. The Dried Fish Matters project brings an interdisciplinary team to address the major oversight. The project's goal is to bring together a diverse team of researchers, practitioners, who are expert on fish, food security, livelihood in South and Southeast Asia. The aim is Dried Fish Matter project will develop novel methodology to share knowledge widely. So we have identified key areas of policy intervention to strengthen the dried fish economy in Bangladesh. Hello, my name is Derek Johnson. I am project director of the Dried Fish Matters project. In the previous part of this roundtable session on food, Eric Thrift introduced the Global Dried Fish Literature Survey. Eric highlighted our findings from that research about food science. In this presentation, I draw on the same research effort, but focus on the state of knowledge on improvement in the global literature on dried fish. Improvement is about the deliberate desire to make something better. In the Dried Fish Matters project, we hold that dried fish provide crucial nutritional, economic, livelihoods, women's empowerment, culinary, cultural heritage, and other values. Yet, these benefits are often overlooked or threatened by a variety of factors. Improvement is important as a broad reference point for focusing attention on the contributions of dried fish and enhancing those contributions. We are aware of the critical development literature on the idea of improvement, but leave that aside in this short presentation. A key component of the Global Dried Fish Literature Survey was a quantitative analysis of the main themes that characterize the dried fish literature. The figure on this slide summarizes that analysis. The figure shows the relative weight of six central themes in the dried fish literature. As Eric noted in his presentation, the largest focus on improvement in the dried fish literature is technical food science efforts to improve dried fish, dried fish product quality. This orientation is clear from the food science dominance of the literature, as the chart on this slide shows. The second area of work on improvement related to dried fish is in the economic sphere. The potential of these studies is to identify interventions that could result in increased value addition, reduce inefficiencies in production, or improve livelihoods and quality of work. Research in both of these areas of product improvement and economic innovation addresses key problems associated with dried fish. In both areas, however, there is a gap between problem identification and the effectiveness of research and engagement with dried fish actors to actually realize improvement. This gap is highlighted by the persistence of the idea that solar dryers are a kind of silver bullet to solve product quality and value addition concerns in dried fish value chains. Yet, our research shows that there has been a repeated failure and uptake of solar dryers. Our research suggests that the reason for the gap between problem identification and successful intervention may be the relative lack of inter- or transdisciplinary research on the broader context within which dried fish are produced, distributed, and consumed. I would point to the very low number of references in our literature survey on policy and governance as an indication of this gap in the dried fish literature. 
Unlike the broader fisheries literature, where these themes are dominant areas of concern, their marginality in the dry fish literature suggests that far more work needs to be done to apply the lessons of research on policy, governance, and development to dried fish food systems. Our literature review identified a small number of sources that serve as examples of the broad sense of improvement that we think is needed in work to strengthen dried fish food systems. One of the most important clusters of work that we identified of this type is interdisciplinary research on dried fish value chains in Zambia and the inland fisheries of the African Great Lakes. These studies emphasize the importance of paying careful attention to contextual factors such as the historical legacy of colonialism and to gender ideology as they shape persistent challenges in addressing problems such as post-harvest losses in dried fish value chains. Other examples arising from the Dried Fish Matters project are recent papers by DFM doctoral students Madhu Galapati and Susir Pradhan that look, that look at dried fish value chains from the perspectives of social ecological systems and gender theory. Only when the broader systemic context is considered and a greater diversity of approaches and methods employed, as in studies like these, is it likely that interventions will begin to address the variety of challenges the sector faces in order to sustain the very important benefits of dried fish. Our ambition is for the Dried Fish Matters project to continue to add new approaches, cases, and evidence in Asia to move this agenda for improvement in dried fish food systems forward. Thank you very much. May I now invite Tala for comments? Hi. Uh, <clears throat> you know, in, in very many ways, the, the presentations that we have just listened to and the ones we have not had the opportunity to listen to, uh, they very, very clearly and squarely focuses, uh, focus on the, the lack of attention on, uh, you know, policy and governance in, uh, in, in the field of uh, dry, fish, dry fish processing. Uh, Derek Johnson told us that uh, the extant literature uh, is definitely deficit in terms of, uh, you know, treating, uh, you know, some of the very key aspects of dry, dried fish, uh, you know, processing sector like policy studies and governance studies. Uh, that's a, that as, as a major gap in the literature that uh, they have reviewed. Uh, that is uh, the same point has been reiterated by Taslima in the first presentation where they said that perhaps, you know, like, uh, we, we, we see that there is also a uh, deficit in terms of action. Uh, the policy uh, kind of uh, comparative analysis of policy tells us that maybe, you know, like there is on the one hand, there's a confusion uh, kind of, you know, among terms like policy and governance and development. And on the other hand, there is a complete and total uh, neglect and exclusion of certain segments like dry fish uh, processing from the, uh, from the mainstream uh, policies. And I thought the Slima's paper was also trying to tell us, uh, you know, the, the very uh, kind of, you know, very important connections between ecology, markets, poverty, nutrition, uh, which, uh, you know, those connections need to be uh, addressed by, uh, you know, any meaningful uh, policy analysis or any, any meaningful policy formulation, which we uh, see as completely sort of missing. And uh, if I really uh, uh, look at uh, uh, Dr. Johnson's, uh, you know, findings, you know, uh, I would also tend to ask this question as to who are those researchers who are interested in doing research and, uh, you know, in, in, in these kinds of sectors and where is knowledge created uh, and what kind of knowledge is being created and what are the methodological fascinations of many of, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the researchers who are currently engaged with sectors like dried fish uh, you know, the, the, if, you, if you look at dried fish as a commodity, uh, you know, a kind of a, a product which needs to be kind of modernized to suit the taste of the market, then uh, it's going to really create certain kinds of, uh, you know, certain kinds of uh, sort of knowledge, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, in, I, unfortunately, we have also not 
listen to Purnima's presentation, but in her presentation, she was actually trying to tell us that some of those concerns have not been even translated into actual outcomes in the sense that still the, uh, the quality of dried fish, whether it is imported or local, uh, it's really very bad. So a lot of research is being done in the food sciences, uh, kind of a discipline about, uh, you know, quality and upgradation and, uh, you know, like improvement of dried fish, but we, we see an extremely inferior, uh, you know, product quality uh, when it comes to actual market sort of condition. So even that, I think, is a, a serious sort of, a, uh, you know, mismatch that one sees in the, in the, in the, in the field. And I thought I can also make a, uh, you know, very quick comment about the presentations that we have not seen. Uh, that is the, one of the presentations by Jania and Raktima, who uh, really, uh, in, or who, are, who are trying to tell us that how important it is to collapse the frameworks, the analytical frameworks, and uh, bring in elements of, uh, you know, very relevant uh, analytical frameworks, like, for instance, political ecology itself is a very interesting dynamic framework where you talk about ecology and political uh, sort of institutions and kind of you know, the insights from institutional economics or, you know, political science together to kind of, you know, uh, delineate the space which that we want to scope uh, a map and analyze, and also to kind of, you know, come to more realistic and more uh, relevant uh, policy solutions or policy resolutions to the problems that we have. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, in, 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 in sort of, uh, in nutshell, I think that uh, I also have the luxury to kind of, you know, look at the whole thing, you know, the entire set of discussions we had. I think uh, these uh, papers and these presentations very eloquently sort of, you know, uh, present in front of us the criticality of a sector like uh, a very kind of, you know, non-glamorous sector like dried fish processing, which is not really sort of uh, gathered or gained the attention of mainstream, even fisheries policies. The significance of that sector in terms of combining various, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, various uh, research uh, frameworks and various pol policy goals uh, towards enhancing uh, the, the well-being of, uh, you know, people who are engaged with it, mostly from the very uh, sort of, you know, backward, uh, disadvantaged uh, sections of uh, the population. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tara. So um, I think this will conclude the, the whole sec uh, session. Uh, as we have heard, the, um, the, the project have actually, the presentation have actually very well articulated how the, the dry fish are being invisible in the whole studies. And then uh, there's a, a high need for interdisciplinarity. The more stronger focus in social science is quite important. Uh, dry fish do tend to be invisible because as Ben was saying, it's part of the rhythm of everyday life. It's so much integrated into our routine of life. And then that's where it become very invisible. So this project is very much contributing to making to really go into this uh, unattended area of research through, uh, as you have seen, through three areas of uh, a focus value chain approach that they're taking very strongly. Also, focus on labor, migrant labor, wage laborers, daily laborers is also another very strong uh, focus that you have seen. Also, and then the issue of food and nutrition, uh, nutrition for the poor and also for food safety as well. Value chain and our approach is very important, especially when we are trying to look at the, the, from the perspective of gender analysis, because uh, through the value chain analysis, we'll be able to look at all the division of labor that is happening and then uh, really highlight women's uh, uh, contribution to the whole fisheries, not fishing, but fisheries uh, sector. It also will be able to identify who is benefiting what, the structure of benefit share is it being uh, uh, monopolized by the large people or not? And then also looking at how the, uh, the resources 
are diversified into market, into consumption. Consumption can be human consumption, can be consumption for the animals. It, a market can be also traditional, it can be modern. So all these tech contexts are also there. So we can see here that, uh, yes, so, uh, some people might say that dry fish might be already kind of become obsolete because transportation facilities are making it easier to access fresh fish. But as you have seen in all the presentation, the, the study of dry fish really deepens our understanding on small scale fisheries management. Uh, with this, we would like to uh, close the session. Just for announcement, the DFM project have uh, is hosting another session tomorrow, the same time uh, uh, to launch the new DFM ebook uh, on the dried fish matters ebook uh, tomorrow. So please join there as well for more discussion. Thank you very much, everybody, for the participation.